Hello, everybody, and welcome to the end of week seven of the 50-day property challenge brought to you by EDBF Property Academy and Private Property. Today, we'd like to show you a few clips of our discussions with Jared, where he is nearing the end of his first property purchase. And because he is nearing the end, we thought we would discuss with Maedeval, our attorney, on what the process is of transferring a property from one person to another. So let us first listen to the discussion we had with Jared, and then we will hear what Maedeval had to say about the transfer process. Today, we only have Jared in the room, and uh, we're going to be talking to him about a number of things, but most especially where he's at with his uh, challenge at the moment in the 50-day property challenge. So we are now in week seven already. Um, wow, the time has flown, eh, Jared? <laughs> Definitely. Listen, it's been quite a journey, and it feels like it's happening so fast, but mm. keeping in mind 50-day challenge, so it will feel like it's speeding through. And um, as mentioned before, we're still learning so much, but it's been exciting to, to actually see myself entering the space and being able to actually make it work. You know, um, as you know, Nigel, we rang the virtual bell for me. With <laughs> yeah. the front of the and um, I'm very excited to say that pretty soon I'm entering the transfer process, which um, through previous conversations, I'm sort of familiar with, but of course I'll be tapping into all of you just, just to guide me a bit further. So that's mm. starting off. And at the same time, you also did tell me that I have to find another property. <laughs> and um, that it, um, it was a property I didn't think I would be interested in. It is slightly out of my price range, uh, sitting at 1.4 mil, 1.399. And um, it's a heritage property. There's a lot of history attached to it. It's a four bedroom. It's got big grounds of about almost 3,000 square meters. So it's got the right, I'm, I think I'm really interested in creating Airbnb opportunities, especially as tourism opens up. And um, I'm really interested in the property, but like I've mentioned to you, it's, it's, it's out of that price range, that easy price range where you can just uh, uh, grab something quickly. So I needed to ask uh, you and your team to help me figure out how to acquire the funds. I know that as we've journeyed, we've spoken about um, speaking to the banks or um, getting your funds from other people, using other people's money, which always sounds like the favorite to me. <laughs> and so I just need to learn a bit more about that. Um, but I'm excited that I'm on this journey and I really want to capitalize on all this information that I have and, and build the portfolio um, over a period of time. Um, but I'm reaching the goal. I'm just happy that I got started with all of you guys. So Mm. All right. That's, good. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So I mean, I'm very glad that, uh, you know, we got in the first half of the of the program, you got to a point where you were ready now uh, putting your offer to purchase the, the cash yes. available between yes. yourself, your wife and a couple of other friends, um, which yes. in, in effect is one of the ways to raise capital um, uh, and using other people's money is getting friends and family involved. So that's just one Correct. of the ways that you right. that you can raise money for for a project like this um and i'm so, and i'm very glad that you are now in that transfer process later on uh this week um or today maybe even we'll have a chat with maya deval where we'll talk yeah. about the transfer process and how that works and so that you can also be enlightened in terms of um of the entire process very often we as buyers and sellers even don't see what happens in the back end with the attorneys and the title, the, the title deeds, the deeds office, all of that kind of thing. So I want to just showcase that to you and to the public so that you guys also know what's going on in the back end while you sit and wait and twiddling your thumbs, <laughs> waiting for your transfer to, to happen. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm very, very chuffed that we are almost there. Um, and I, I, I think probably based on the timing, we'll probably this week already you will take a uh, transfer. Um, yes. And yeah, so, so it sounds, sounds uh, like we are there. We're almost there. <laughs> Woo! It almost felt impossible in the beginning of all of this. Yeah, so yeah. it's for everybody watching on this journey with us. Um, you can see that it is possible. You know, mm. it's just about having en enough knowledge and knowing exactly the kind of portfolio that you want to build. And yeah, while yeah. The, in the property game is where it's at, you know, it's about uh, diving in now. You know, because as things 
open up. I can physically see prices changing. Properties that maybe dropped in price during the pandemic have now started sort of balancing out to where they were before. Um, so now's the time. It's quite amazing to see that in your limited knowledge of the property sector, the kinds of stuff you're talking about, the fact that the, that the market is leveling out and you clearly have done a lot of research in terms of the markets and so on. <laughs> I look on the app. So um, <laughs> I am watching it all the time. I bookmark some properties so you can see the changing. And when engaging with, with the, the agents that are representing the properties, they themselves will give you um, transparency on yes. this. What, it, what the value is, it dropped to X amount. And there are forums, as you've mentioned before, wh where you can check what, what the property, what the rate it is going at, if it, if it yeah. dropped, if it what the properties around that specific property are sold for, um, just to give you insight into maybe what you're getting yourself into and if it's a good area to, to, to invest in, you know, is it dropping, is it increasing, is it just due to the pandemic or has, is the area becoming a sort of the area or is there a decline of people moving out? And these are all very important things that I've, I've, I've seen through listening to all of you and through all the many uh, features within the EDPF Academy's uh, website that you can tap into to make sure that um, you're making informed and insightful decisions. So I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying all of these things because a few weeks ago I was as green as an avocado, you know, and now, now we're here talking about property and it's quite cool to see that in a matter of weeks, you can, you can be part of the conversation, you know? Yeah, for sure. And even, even green avocados, when you cut them open, you leave them a little bit, they become brown. So you, you are now clearly um, seasoned after a couple of there weeks we of, of being on this, on this program. And, uh, and we hope that, you know, through the, the, the three years that you are still going to be with us, um, yeah. that you will learn so much more and that you'll be able to grow your portfolio to a substantial size before you leave this program in 2020, what's that, 2024, at the end of 2024, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so you, you asked me a question um, in terms of capital and how you now start to expand your portfolio. So mm -hmm. um, your, your situation is that you don't earn a fixed income. Correct. which makes it very difficult, actually. Um, and people might think, ah, oh, no, he's a celebrity. He's got lots of money. That's <laughs> far from the truth. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the reason, one of the reasons you came to us is to say, I'd like to start my property portfolio, but because right. I don't have a fixed income, the banks are not inclined to necessarily look at me as a, uh, as a potential person to, to invest into uh, from a property um, investment perspective. So how do I then, um, as somebody who doesn't have that fixed income, how do I now find the money if I can't raise the money through the bank? So let's have a quick dive into that. We don't have to do a deep dive today, but uh, uh -huh. if anybody who wants to do a deep dive, we've got um, some videos, free videos on our website, www.edpfpropertyacademy.com. They can go to the website for the deep dive. But let's just talk about some of the typical ways that you can raise money for a property investment opportunity. Okay, so uh, you can chill a little bit. Let me do some talking and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat again um, after, right. after I'm done. So the, obviously the, the first way to raise capital is the bank. So if you have a steady income, whether that is um, because you've got a job or because you've got a contract with an organization, um, or if you just have, like you have gigs all the time and you've got steady income then flowing through your accounts every single month, what the bank will then do is they will look at your lowest and your highest. And then uh, for the last six months, and then they will do sort of an average of what your, your salary has or your income has been for those few months. And then they could even use that as your repayment ability. What they will then also do um, is to, if you have now, um, after like with Antabaleng, for example, uh, Matt Alshi has already purchased two properties. And uh, we had a conversation with Absa last week where they have, um, they are busy now working with her to say, because you bought two properties already, 
We can help you in your third property and beyond to use what they call their future rental income product. So even, even if you don't have steady income or, or if you don't have a salary, the bank could still help you with different products that they have. But, but if the bank cannot help you, then what we then do, like you did with your first property that you've now purchased and you're just waiting for transfer, basically, you, you first thing you do is go to friends and family. I last week um, and this week, in fact, two weeks in a row now, I have done an exercise with the students in our program where I've asked them to literally just take their phone. Uh, I've got a very funky cover. It's all green, light green and everything. Take their phone <laughs> and take the top 10 names where they think that those people possibly have money to spend and want to invest into something, but don't have the time and don't have the energy or the wherewithal to understand where to invest, but they have the money. And the exercise was quite telling because what then happened all the, in the first week that we did this exercise two weeks ago, um, a group of second years in the program, they started phoning. I gave them 45 minutes on a Saturday to phone about five or 10 people. And within 45 minutes, almost every single one of them came back with a positive answer of almost everybody they phoned to say, yes, I can invest in something like this. If you take the lead, you find the deals for us. We will co-invest with you. And the minimum that, that any one of those students was able to raise was 750,000 Rand. And there was some that, raised, that was able to raise a lot more in 45 minutes on a Saturday. So imagine how much, if you have all this time with all your contacts and your phone book, and you start making those phone calls to say you're in this EDPF program, you want to raise capital for your projects. And I've now, you've now got this new project uh, that you want to do. Uh, it's over a million rand. So it's out of that price range that you were initially looking for, but it does fall within that category of Airbnb and those kinds of things that you want to do. So if you pick up your phone and you start phoning those people on your phone uh, that's listed on your, uh, your database and you start calling them and say, listen, I, I'm looking to do this thing. I'm finding the deals. If you co-invest with me in a company that we register, then um, they get a share in the business. So that's one way, friends and family. Then another way that you can raise money is vendor finance. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, it sounds so complicated. What is this thing called vendor finance? Effectively, vendor finance is when you use the seller's money to finance your purchase, which sounds insane. I mean, how, why would a seller pay you to buy a property from them? <laughs> but it's possible in this game. What you do is you go to a seller and you say to them, look, I've got this, um, this ability to convert opportunities. And I've learned all these things from the EDPF program. And what I want to do with your property is to take the property and convert it into an Airbnb type uh, scenario. Over a period of time, I'm gonna pay you back. I'm going to pay you, number one, a rental, which will be the normal rental and what they call an occupational rental. So I will occupy the property and I will rent the property from you for say 20,000 rand a month, whatever the number is. Then take that property and then you go and rent it out to other people on an Airbnb system. Now on Airbnb, you can make a lot more money than if you're renting it out to an individual or a family. So then the profit you make of the Airbnb, that's your profit. But then you take that profit and you then actually put that back in again and you continue to pay the owner, the landlord of the property, the owner of the property. And over a period of say five years, you can then pay back the entire amount of money that you then owe the seller because he has now sold it to you on almost like a lease agreement type. You know, when you buy a car, um, when you buy a vehicle, you finance the vehicle over five years and you pay the bank um, over that period of time. You can do the same with property. And they register in the deeds office 
um, uh, against the title deed, the fact that you have now purchased the property on this basis, and that over the five-year period, you would then pay the owner or the seller the full amount. So instead of going to the bank for the money, you're saying to the seller, I'm not going to pay the bank, I'll pay you. And okay. you actually use this property gen to generate the income in order to pay and it back. Yes, but that's obviously subject to to the reasons for the seller wanting to to put the property on the market. You know, okay. so it's obviously if they want the cash front if they need the lump sum. Um, but that sounds pretty good because I think the pro property that I saw is quite new, and I've already spoken to an agent. Of course, it's in um, the Karua, so I can't just get there like this afternoon to go and view. But it doesn't sound like there's a rush for the sale. And um, that might be a worthwhile conversation to have. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. So now that we've heard from Jared in terms of his property journey, let's listen in on the conversation we had with Mayor Deval regarding the transfer process. There is so much that goes into that process and the attorneys have to do so much paperwork so that they can transfer the property from a seller to a buyer. So let's hear what Mayer Deval had to say. Today, with Jared and Matt Al, we have in the room uh, the very famous Mr. Mayer Deval, my favorite attorney in Cape Town. Um, he's been involved with the EDPF program for close on five years now, where he is teaching our entrepreneurs in the program um, everything they need to know about the legal aspects of property. Today, we have asked Mayer to talk to us about the transfer process. As you know, Jared has now bought his first property and Matt Al is about to buy her third property. And while they wait for the transfer to happen into their names, we just thought maybe it would be good for us to talk about how that transfer process happens. Because as buyers and sellers, after all the paperwork is done, we sit back and we wait and we're not sure what's going on in the background. So we thought maybe today we would talk to Maya and ask him, from the day we signed the offer to purchase, what all the processes are until the day we actually take transfer. So I'm going to be quiet now and I'm going to let Maya talk. And if there's anything that uh, I think we need to maybe clarify, I'll then interrupt him and ask him to clarify that particular issue or topic. So Maya, all over to you. Our audience know you. We've already had some conversations together. So no need to really introduce yourself this time. Um, but Maya, just tell us all about the transfer process. So now you've paid your 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 uh, attorney has drafted the transfer documents for a seller to sign, also sign affidavits and transfer duty declarations for the buyer to sign, set up a meeting to go and sign the documents. In the meantime, the bond attorneys will be instructed by the bank that issued and proved the bond and they will also draw documents after they've received the property details from the transferring attorneys and they will prepare the mortgage documents to sign. It's normally a fixed stack of documents to sign. Some banks have gone into electronic signature which is really great because you get a stack like that um, of documents to work through and it's it's quite intimidating documents because you're signing waivers you're signing indemnities it's a lot of documents and that and luckily where the conveyancing attorney needs to sit with a client and explain to them all the ins and outs of that and the main thing is that you've got to sign a debit order as well and that debit order dictates which time of the month the debit will run off your bond, bond account something to remember is that if your bond is registered on the 7th or the 10th and you indicate it on the 1st, just keep extra money in your bond account in case the bond goes off and never think that, ah, oh, worry, I don't worry, it's not going to go off. Make sure you don't want to skip your first payment once, once the bond is, re uh, is, is registered and the debit go order goes off. So now, now we've looked at the transferring attorney draft to power of attorney, the seller's documents, apply for rates, apply for um, the size documents. And if there's a body corporate or a home owner association involved, then you'll also write a letter to the body corporate or the HOA and inform them that the property has been sold. And usually there's a condition in a particular section of Title Act that you can't transfer the property unless provision has been made for the payment of the levies to the body corporate. The conveyances provide a certificate <coughs> once that arrangement has been made or been paid, and then you are able to lodge the deeds in the deeds office. 
Remember that I said there are three types of attorneys involved. The transferring attorney, the bond cancellation, and the new bond, registra new bond registration. So the transferring attorney will phone all the attorneys and say, tomorrow we are going to the deeds office. Please give me your documents in bef before we go to the deeds office. They all meet outside or in a, in a particular room, and you get the deeds of everybody. And the transferring attorney then links up all three transactions by writing on the, on the outside cover that this transaction, that one, and that one are linked with each other. They put them together, put them in a box at the deeds office, and then the deeds office will go to the sorting room. In the sorting room, the deeds office will then pair all the documents to give it out together, and they will go and pull the information that is on the deeds office system to check, are there any interdicts against the property? Maybe somebody brought an interdict against you selling the property. They also check that you haven't been sequestrated. They also check that the property details are correct, and they print out all that document and put it in the folder. That goes through a scanning process with a barcode, and then that gets put on a trolley then and goes to the sorting room. The sorting room will then go out and dish it out to the junior examiners. The junior examiners normally got a day or two to go through all the documents. Make sure that all the documents are there. It's now the power of attorney, the new deed, the rights clearance, the transfer duty clearance, the levy clearance, and also your old title deed and any supporting documents that go with that. Once they've gone through that, they send it back to the sorting room, and that takes another three, four days. They scan everything. Luckily, we can track every transaction in the deeds office through the scanning, and then it goes to the senior examiner. They also make some notes on the inside of your file if they do find that there are typing errors or documents missing, and if there's a huge document missing or error, they'll put a big R on it. Now, that you don't want to see in your life because it's the R means rejected. And you never want to see a rejected. So, because then you get embarrassed, you've got to phone your clients and say, oh, I made a mistake and I've got to do something again. And there are errors that come through it's human, but sometimes documents are not there that's supposed to be there or these officers make some note and say, I'm not sure about what you're trying to do here. Can you come and explain to me? Sometimes you find that they just reject the deeds rather than asking the question. When the deeds come through to the final uh, examiner on level three, and then they normally, after 10, 14 days, they appear in the preparation room, what we call short the prep room. When it appears in the prep room, everybody, your clerk at the deeds office will pick up the deeds and phone the office and say, hey, the transfer of Nigel to Maya just came up for registration today, and there's a bond to be cancelled, so we phone the bond attorneys, we phone the cancellation attorneys, and say, okay, are we all ready that we can hand in for registration the next day or the next day. We have five days there in the preparation room, the prep room, to organize the finances. Sometimes the seller, the buyer must pay you a little bit of fees. You need to collect a short from the purchase price. In between that time, the estate agent normally has also arranged electrical and beetle and other compliance certificates, and that's also sent to all the parties. So sometimes there's a hiccup with one of the compliance certificates are not issued. And then you've got five days to sort out those small items, sometimes big items. And once everybody is re ready and the secretary in the office and the conveyancing attorney then prepares the final finances, you prepare one for your file to see that the money that came in and the money that's paid out will balance. Very important. The second one is what money gets paid to the seller. Because on date of, of transfer, that uh, conveyancing attorney will pay the money over to the seller less what has been paid to the bond, less what is paid to the agent. So the attorney will do all those payments and facilitate all those payments. And then important that they have the banking details of the estate agent and also the, the FFC license of the estate agent and also then the seller's banking details. And by that time, the bond of the purchaser will kick in. That money will be paid through by guarantee into the bank account of a transferring attorney. So they will collect all the money do all the reconciliations, and then they will pay out to everybody who needs to be paid out and do a final reconciliation of finances and present that to the seller and the buyer and also for your file because it's critical that your file ends up in a zero. That is once you've taken your fees. So that's very much in a nutshell the conveyancing process. Now the deeds office goes out and the conveyancing attorney appears in the morning between 9.30 to 10 o'clock uh, um, appears at the deeds office <clears throat> with in front of a con um, that's now one step I skip but you appear in front of the deeds office to a register of deeds to sign the deeds which you call the execution of the deeds 
And once you execute the deeds, then it means actually it's not like you're cutting off somebody's head like execution. But the deeds office, where the rest of deeds also sign the deeds, they also put that on their tracking system. And then, then they, after that, they keep the title deeds for about a month or two or three, sometimes depending on the, on the um, turnaround times. And then they capture all that information on their system that electronically you are now also indicated that you are the new owner and the old owner has, is no longer the owner. So that takes about da that data capturing take a few weeks and then the title deeds are returned to the, to the conveyancing attorney. If a buyer was a cash buyer, you'll call the buyer and say, yeah, congratulations, here's your title deed and you must now please put your title deed in a safe place. The reason for a safe place is that in the old days, you could just ask the deeds office for a, a replacement copy. If your title deed is lost and they issue a title deed, then they became kind of fed up with people are losing their title deeds. And now they say you've got to advertise in the government gazette and the local newspaper. And that takes about a free, that's about a three week period. So you lose time. Plus, you cost you about four and a half thousand rand in advertising cost. So please, if you have a title deed, put it in a safe place. If you have a bond over the property, the attorneys will send you a copy of the title deed and they'll send the original to the bank because the bank keeps that in safe custody as the security until you have paid up the bond. So again, what flows from this is again, your will. Whenever you have bought a property, go and review your title deed. Go and review your insurance because you've got an asset now. If you have a mortgage, make sure that your, you have insurance that can settle the debt on your date of death because you don't want to leave that debt to your family. They may have to sell the property if you haven't if you haven't got insurance to cover it. Sometimes we find that a husband and wife are married, the husband is economically active, the wife is stay at home mum, and now the husband died and the wife has got to sell the house because they didn't take out insurance to cover the debt. If you've got a cash, um, if you bought cash, then obviously you've got um, cash on the, the, then if you don't have a mortgage to repay, but keep that title deed in a safe condition, in a safe place. And then again, look at your will to redraft. We also provide that service for all EDPF members. We give them free service for a new will. So please make contact with us that we can actually also assist you with a free will. And that's me, a wrap up on the conveyancing process. I think I've most likely covered quite a lot in that few um, minutes. Wow, that's fantastic. And listen, I, I applaud you. Uh, for the patience that you show. I mean, I see it every day. Um, attorneys have to have extreme patience with clients who literally know nothing about the process, um, don't understand legal documentation, don't understand the implications of the legal documents that they sign. Um, and often, I see it more often than not, where a, a document gets stuck in front of somebody's face and they just sign without even thinking. So I applaud you and I thank you for the service that you render uh, to us as EDPF and our, our students, um, as well as the public at large. But uh, for now, Maya, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's always a pleasure having a conversation with you because literally every time I talk to you, I learn something new and I know that our students and the public out there with this 50 day challenge has learned quite a lot about the, the transfer process, what goes into it and all the legal documentation and the processes. It is absolutely amazing how you guys cope on a daily basis with us. So thank you, Maya, for your time. Thank you for the public out there that uh, listen to us diligently every day on this 50 day challenge. We are nearing the end of the challenge now. It's the reason why we thought we'd talk about uh, the transfer process, because it is something that you have to understand. You have to know when you do a property purchase or even a property sale, um, that you have to know these things and understand what goes into it so that you don't get frustrated when it takes three or four weeks longer than you thought it would. But thank you, Maya. Thank you, uh, Private Property, for allowing us this platform um, for the EDPF Property Academy to run this 50 day challenge. Um, and thank you to you, the audience for diligently watching us. Thank you, Maya, for that extremely insightful discussion. Thank you everybody for joining us on this journey. And at the end of week seven, we hope that you've learned so much 
that you are able to purchase your first property within this 50-day challenge.